Hi guys and welcome to part 2 on the law of security and credit transactions. Today we'll talk about the contract of deposit. Okay? So if you like my videos and you want to see more, please hit the subscribe button. For my regular viewers, please remember that this is only for educational purposes and is not a substitute for proper legal advice. For my students, I remember that this is additional learning material and is not a substitute for studying and understanding the law. Now, what is a contract of deposit? It is a contract constituted from the moment a person receives a thing belonging to another for the purpose of safely keeping it and returning the same. Okay? So, let's talk about the definition. Okay? It says that it is constituted from the moment a person receives a thing. That means that this is a real contract. In other words, it is perfected upon delivery. Okay? Now, it talks about a thing. What may the thing be in a contract of deposit? As a rule, it only pertains to movable things. However, in judicial deposit, immovable things may be the subject of judicial deposit. Okay? Next, it talks about a thing belonging to another. Okay? But this does not mean that the depositor has to be the owner. Okay? All the depositor needs is either a possessory right or a right to use the same. Okay? Why? Because ownership is not transferred to the depository. Okay? So, again, the depositor does not have to be the owner. Now, what is the implication? First, the depository cannot ask the depositor to prove his title. The title of the depositor cannot be disputed. There are also obligations on the part of the depository. In case the depository finds out that uh, the thing is stolen and who is the true owner, then he has the obligation to inform the true owner that he has the thing. In case the true owner does not claim the thing, then the depository will be relieved of his obligations by returning the thing to the depositor. Now, if the depository has a reasonable grounds to believe that the thing was not lawfully acquired, he may likewise return the thing to the depositor. Okay? Now, there is an obligation involved in the definition and this is the principal purpose of a contract of deposit, namely safekeeping. Okay? Safekeeping is very important because if the principal purpose is something else such as use, then it may be a different contract such as a contract of loan. Okay? Okay. Now let's move on. A contract of deposit is generally gratuitous. Okay? However, in the following instances, deposit is onerous. When? Of course, first when the parties stipulate that deposit will be for compensation. Second, when the deposit, uh, the depository is engaged in the business of storing goods, such as a warehouseman. In that case, the deposit is likewise onerous. And finally, in cases of property which are saved from destruction without the knowledge of the depositor. Okay? Now, let's go to the kinds of deposit. First, we have voluntary meaning that which is constituted by the will of the depositor, okay? However, we also have one instance where there are two or more persons who are in conflict over their right over a thing, then they can deposit the thing with a third person, okay? This uh, conflict between uh, the two people can be resolved in an action called an interpleader, okay? So, while the interpleading, interpleader is ongoing, the thing may be deposited with a third person known as the depositary. Now, let's talk about a few rules in uh, voluntary deposit. Let's talk about incapacity. Let's talk about what if the depositor is incapacitated. In this case, if the depository receives the thing or accepts the thing as deposit, then he acquires all the obligations of a depository. Okay? Now, the only person who can ask for the return of the thing would be the guardian or administrator of the incapacitated depositor. The depository cannot allege the incapacity of the depositor to prevent his uh, guardian or administrator from uh, asking for the return of the thing. Okay? What if 
at the time of the constitution of the deposit, the depositor had capacity but subsequently lost it, then in that case, only the uh, guardian or administrator of the estate of that uh, incapacitated uh, depositor can ask for the return of the thing. Now, what if it's the other way around? Okay? In case it is the depositary who is incapacitated, then his only obligations are either to return the thing or to pay the, the amount by which he was benefited or the price of the thing. Okay? Now, let's go to the obligations of the depositary or the person to whom the thing was deposited. Okay? First obligation, it's the principal purpose of the contract. It is to safely keep the thing. What is the degree of diligence? It is the default set in the law on obligations and contracts or that which is known as the diligence of a good father of a family. However, the degree of diligence may be higher such as extraordinary diligence in case it is stipulated by the parties, in case it is the depositary who voluntarily agreed to constitute a deposit, or in case the deposit is for compensation, or in case through the deposit, the depositary ready, receives a benefit. Okay? So in those cases, deposit will be uh, subject to a higher degree of diligence or extraordinary diligence. Now, second obligation, the depositary must return not only the thing, but in case it produces uh, fruits, then to return the fruits, its accessions, and the accessories. Okay? And uh, in case again, as I said, if two or more persons are claiming a right over the thing, the depositary may compel them through an action for interpleader to determine who is better entitled to the thing. Now, what if there is a different juridical tie amongst the depositors? Let's say the depositors are jointly bound. Then in that case, the, each depositor may only claim what is proportionately due to him. Okay? What if they are solidarily bound? Then the, uh, the transfer of the thing to one of those depositors will extinguish the obligation. Except if there is a stipulation that the thing must only be returned to one of those solidary depositors. And in that case, the thing must be given only to that person. Okay? Now, when must the thing be returned? As a general rule, the thing may be returned only upon demand of the depositor. Okay? Thing may be returned upon demand of the depositor. Now, what if there is a period for the deposit? It is still within the right of the depositor to claim return of the thing upon his demand. However, there are certain exceptions. First, while the thing is in the possession of the depositary, the thing is judicially attached. Then in that case, the depositor cannot demand the return of the thing right away. What else? There is a third party who is opposing the return of the thing to the depositor. Then in that case, the depositor cannot ask for the thing at his own will. Okay? There is a duty to inform the depositor in case there is a third person who is opposing the return of the thing to the depositor. Okay? Now, I, would, I just want to... Uh, uh, note, huh? there is a an instance where it is the depositary himself who may return the thing, okay, at his own instance. In, in what I was discussing earlier, it is the depositor who is asking for the thing back. Okay, now I want what I want to talk about is it is the depositary who no longer wants to keep it. Okay, can the depositary do this? Yes only if he has justifiable reasons to return the thing to the depositor, okay? Now, what are justifiable reasons? Of course, it will depend on the circumstances of the case. So, the depositary may return the thing to the depositor for justifiable reasons even before the period of the deposit is uh, not yet lapsed, no? Unless the deposit was for a consideration. Okay? So, if it's gratuitous, the depositary may return the thing if he has justifiable reasons. But, 
if the deposit is uh, compensated or the depositor pays for the, the service of deposit, then the depository cannot return the thing even if he has justifiable reasons, even if he is inconvenienced by uh, the deposit of the thing. He may not return it and he has to respect the period. Okay? Now, okay. Now, where must the where must the deposit or the thing where must the thing be returned? Okay, of course, if there is a stipulation, then the place subject of the stipulation will govern. It should be at that place. And who pays for the transportation? It is the depositor who pays the expenses. Okay? Now, when there is no place stipulated, then the place of return is where the thing is situated, even if that is not the place where they agreed to have the deposit. Okay? Provided that there is no malice on the part of the depository. Okay? Now, uh, let's move on to the second obligation. The depository is not allowed to use the thing deposited. Of course, because this is uh, uh, the deposit is constituted based on the trust reposed by the depositor on the depository. Okay? So the depository is not allowed to use the thing. However, of course, this is subject to exceptions. There are certain instances when the use of the thing is necessary for its preservation, such as in the case of a car. From time to time, it has to be used so that the machine will not be broken. Okay? Now, in case it has be, to be used for preservation, it must be used only for that purpose. In the same example of a car, it should not be used for a road trip to Baguio. Okay? Next, a general rule again is the depository should not use the thing. Second exception is if there is permission, express permission by the depositor. Okay? This permission is never presumed and must be proven. Okay? Okay. Why? Now, the depository should not use the thing. Because remember, in my discussion on the definition earlier, it said that the principal purpose of the uh, contract of deposit is for safekeeping. Because if use is the principal uh, object, it may either be a comodatum or a mutuum, no? Under the uh, discussion on loan in my previous video, okay? Now let's talk about what if the thing is uh, money, no? As I said, it will be it will constitute a contract of mutuum because it involves the use of money. So what what does this leave us with in terms of, in the case of uh, bank deposits? Are bank deposits the uh, the ones you can uh, retrieve in the ATM? Are those contracts of deposit? Are they subject to the rules on contracts of deposit? The answer is no. Okay, why? Because bank deposits are really irregular deposits. They are actually a contract of loan with uh, the depositor, you, as the uh, creditor, and the bank as the debtor. That is why you earn interest. Because this is actually a loan. You are lending your money to the bank. Okay? And uh, for, the, for the bank's use of your money, the bank will pay you interest. Okay? So it is really a contract of loan. Or... It can be considered a contract of irregular deposit. Okay? So again, bank deposits are not really deposits, but they are rather contract of loan. And they are governed by the provisions of loan. Okay? Okay, let's go to the next obligation of the depository. Okay? The depository is not allowed to, de to deposit the thing with a third person. Again, this is based on the trust and confidence reposed on the depository. Because I trusted you, depository, to keep my thing, do not give it to another person to keep, okay? Now, in case the depository deposits it with a third person, then the depository will be liable in case the thing is lost, okay? He is liable for loss in case he deposits the thing with a third person. However, this... Uh, obligation may be done away with through stipulation. Okay? In other words, the parties may agree that the, the depository may deposit a thing with a third person. However, of course, the stipulation must be expressed. Okay? And 
there is an instance where the depository will be liable in case of loss even if a uh, deposit with a third person is allowed and this is when the third person is manifestly unfit or careless and the thing is lost while in the possession of that third person and finally the depository will be liable for the acts fault or negligence of his employees okay okay let's go to the next obligation of the depository the depository has to notify the depositor if he's going to change the way of the deposit in other words there may be a certain method by which uh, both parties agreed that the uh, thing will be deposited no now the depository may change that however before he does so he must first notify the depositor that he's gonna change it okay the only exception here is if there is a clear danger to the thing okay if the delay in uh, giving notice caused by giving the notice will cause danger to the thing then the notice requirement may be dispensed with at that moment okay but after the change to the way of the deposit has been made the depository should still notify the depositor that a change to the way of deposit was made okay next next obligation let's say now that the thing deposited consisted of uh, instruments or securities which bear interest no they earn interest okay so of course if those things are deposited with a depository the depository must collect the interest and of course the capital and he must also take steps to preserve the value of those things okay so uh the exception here would be on safety deposit boxes okay uh, safety deposit boxes may be uh, are those things which you may have seen in movies no these boxes where you put personal items such as jewelry or titles of land or other uh, precious objects okay that is uh, not strictly a deposit okay this is a special kind of deposit which is not uh, subject to the rules on uh, voluntary deposit okay in this case this is actually a contract of bailment again what is bailment bailment is a contract where of delivery of a thing for a special purpose with an obligation to return it in case that special purpose has already been accomplished okay in a contract of bailment there is mutual benefit the bailor and the bailee both receive a benefit now in the case of a security deposit box the depositor receives a benefit of being able to store those uh, precious goods uh, under the security of the bank while the bank receives uh, compensation for renting out those boxes okay so this is not strictly a deposit this is a special kind of deposit more appropriately known as a contract of bailment okay next obligation earlier i said uh, yeah, the depository has the obligation to collect the interest this time around we apply a principal principle from the loan agency where in case the depository used the funds deposited he has to pay interest on the sums which he has converted to his own use okay next obligation in general a depository may commingle fungible goods for example grain okay in case what is deposited is grain then the depository if he is so engaged in the storage of grain can just put it in the general mass of goods provided that, that they are of the same kind and quality and what is the effect on the depositors they become owners in common of the mass or they own a proportionate share in that mass of goods okay now that is merely a general rule of course the exception is when the parties stipulate that there should be no commingling okay next obligation the depositor the, the depository in general is not liable for fortuitous events however by stipulation the depository may be liable in case the thing deposited is lost through a fortuitous event also the depository will be liable for loss 
in case the depository used the thing without the permission of the debtor. Another instance of liability for loss is in case the depository delayed in returning the thing, then he will also be liable for uh, loss in case of fortuitous events. Another instance is when the depository allows other people, third persons, to use the thing. Okay? And finally, if there is fraud or negligence on the part of the depository, then he will also be liable for loss of the thing in case of force, major, or fortuitous events. Okay? Next obligation. What if the thing deposited had been delivered by the depositor in a closed or sealed box. Then the obligation of the depository is to return the thing in the same condition in which he received it. Okay? Now, what if it is returned and it's in the seal or the lock has been broken? Then the depository shall be liable for damages. Okay? Now, in case that uh, lock or seal has been broken, there is another obligation on imposed on the depository. It is that he must keep the secret of the thing deposited. Okay? Now, there are instances when the, the depository may find it necessary to open that closed or sealed uh, box containing the thing deposited. Okay? First, if the depository finds it necessary and he is presumed authorized to do so, how do we know he's presumed authorized? If a key has been uh, delivered to the depository, in that case, he can open it to uh, in case it is necessary to open the box. Second, okay, if the instructions of the depositor cannot be executed without opening the box, then that is the second instance when the depository may open the closed or sealed box, okay? And the final obligation, I mentioned this earlier, is to notify or advise the true owner of uh, stolen goods which have been deposited with him, okay? Now we're done with the obligations of the depository. Let's go to the obligations of the depositor, okay? First, no? If the deposit is gratuitous, okay, or for no compensation, then uh, the expenses for preserv preservation will be borne by the depositor, okay? Now, if the deposit is onerous or for compensation, then the general rule is that the depository will be the one to pay for the expenses of preservation. The exception here is, of course, if there is a stipulation where the parties agreed uh, otherwise, no? Okay, second obligation. In case there are losses caused to the depository by reason of the character or nature of the thing, then the depositor should reimburse the depository for the losses. However, this is only a general rule and the following are the exceptions. First, if the depositor was unaware, okay, he was unaware of the nature of the thing that it could cause loss to the depository, okay? Second, uh, that uh, the depositor was uh, not expected to know of the dangerous character of the thing, okay, or that it could cause losses to the depository. Third, when the depository was actually notified of the character of the thing, and finally, even without such notification, it was apparent and the depository knew or could ascertain or was aware that uh, of the nature of the thing that it could cause losses. Finally, let's talk about a right of uh, retention by the depositor. No? The, uh, the right of retention of the depository, rather. No? The depository can retain the thing as pledge until the full payment of the uh, what is due him by the depositor okay again the depository has the right to re retain the thing as pledge until he is fully paid by the depositor for his services okay now how is a voluntary deposit extinguished okay 
first, of course, by uh, the normal uh, modes of extinguishment of contracts, uh, which I have discussed in my other series. No, I have a seven-part series, including payment, compensation, confusion, novation, etc. No, please watch the videos on extinguishment of obligation if you want to uh, learn more. No. Uh, but other than that, there are other uh, special grounds for extinguishment of a voluntary deposit. First, in case of loss or destruction of the thing. Second, in case of a gratuitous deposit, the death of either the depositor or the depositary. Okay? And uh, finally, in case of an onerous deposit. First, the rule is, in case of an onerous deposit, the rights and obligations here are transmitted to the heirs of the depositor or depositary respectively. And now, there is a special rule here. In case the depositary's heir, who did not know of the deposit, sells the thing in good faith, huh? in good faith, then he has an obligation either to return the price or to assign his right to action to the depositor or the depositor's heirs. Okay? Now let's go to another kind of deposit which is called the necessary deposit. Okay? When does a necessary deposit arise? First, out of a legal obligation. What are some examples? First is interpleader which I have discussed earlier. No? In uh, such case, while two or more parties in conflict over a thing are settling their difference, they can differences, they can deposit the thing with a third person who will be the depository. Next, in case of bonds or instruments of credit payable to order or bearer, which are given uh, without security by the use of fructuary, that is another instance. Okay, what is another instance? When the thing pledged, no. Uh, where a thing is pledged and the creditor uses it without authority or misuses the thing, no? In that case, there is a, a necessary deposit constituted by operation of law, okay? There are also others, no? But in general, those are the more, the more famous ones, okay? Another uh, necessary deposit is constituted in times of calamity, such as flood, storm, earthquake, uh, shipwreck, etc. No, in such a case, a uh, deposit is necessary in order to preserve the thing from destruction without the knowledge of the owner. Okay. Finally, we have uh, the situation of hot hotels and uh, inns. Okay. But uh, what hotels and inns, no, or the owners thereof, are constituted as depositaries, subject to the following rules. No, first. There has to be notice given by the owner of the thing that they are bringing in things, no, subject to deposit, their baggages, no, or other precious items. If no notice is given, then uh, the hotel keepers or uh, innkeepers cannot be held liable as depositaries. Second, the the person so uh, bringing the precious goods or uh, their baggage, no, they have to take. The precautions which are advised by the hotel to take. For instance, a common uh, precaution given by hotels are please use safes provided in your room. No, so if you do not take the precautions which uh, the hotel recommends, then the hotel may um, may not be held uh, liable as a depository. Okay. Now this liability of the hotel keeper or innkeeper extends to the whole area of his property, including the annexes, such as a garage, etc. So your car, your uh, let's say you're using a horse for whatever reason, no? Because the law includes animals, no? Any loss, damage to those things uh, will hold the uh, will hold the hotel keeper or innkeeper liable for damages in case of breach of obligation as depository okay now uh, the hotel keeper or innkeeper is likewise uh, responsible for damages caused by his servants or employees or even of strangers okay the only time that uh, hotel keepers will not be liable of uh, for uh, acts of strangers is when these acts of strangers are caused either by fortuitous events, no acts of God, or irresistible force or violence, okay? In other words, if the thief is not armed, 
he does not have guns or knives or is not using irresistible force, then the hotel keepers may be held liable. Okay? May. Only may. Okay? Because this is a uh, part of the negligence of the hotel in keeping uh, security. Okay? Now, the reason for holding the hotel keepers liable is because they are offering themselves out to the public as uh, being capable of giving accommodations with the, of course, the security that should come with it. Okay? And uh, please take note that uh, the hotel cannot free themselves from liability in, the, in, in all the instances that I have discussed simply by post posting notices okay, that they are not liable. That you, you will see these posting of notices. Eh? The hotel is not liable in case, of, uh, in case of loss or damage to your goods. No, as long as notice is given to the hotel and as long as precautions of the hotel are followed, then they will still be held liable. Those notices will do nothing. Okay? Okay, so, uh, this is simply because uh, the things and the person of the depositor are subject to the supervision and control of the hotel. Okay? It is within their full control. Security, uh, watching over the things, upkeep, maintenance, all of that is within the supervision and control of the hotel. So the law holds them liable, regardless of their posting of notices, okay? However, the law gives these hotel keepers a certain right, okay? So in case a person does not pay for lodging or for the services such as food, no? Then the hotel owners or hotel or innkeepers have a right to retain the goods, okay? They have a right to retain the goods as security for payment of unpaid lodging and other services, okay? Finally, we have what is known as uh, judicial deposit or sequestration, okay? This is common, uh, commonly known in uh, remedial law as attachment, receivership, or replevin, okay? And in this case, no, uh, both movables and immovables may be the proper subject of judicial deposit or sequestration, okay? Uh, th this can only be ordered either through a complaint, uh, through an order of the court, or a final judgment, okay? What is the purpose of a judicial deposit or sequestration? It is either to maintain the status quo, okay? The, which is the last peaceable... Uh, last peaceable uh, possession by the parties or it is in order to ensure the rights of the parties by final uh, after final judgment okay and uh, what is the degree of care required it is merely ordinary diligence okay the obligation of the judicial depository will not be relieved until termination of the proceedings in the case Okay, so that's it for uh, the law on deposit. We took up deposit in general, voluntary deposit, which is by the uh, agreement of the parties, necessary deposit, and judicial deposit. Okay? Now, if you want to learn more, please remember to subscribe to my uh, channel. No? So, I'll see you again next time and bye!